to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in this place. He's worthy of it. They've been singing about it. He's holy. His name is holy. I, uh, for the past several weeks, have been toiling with a word from the Lord, and uh, and I and it was a good one. And I really, I was excited to preach. I said, Pastor, I, this is a word that I've gotten. I want to preach it. And then yesterday came, and God changed all of it. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36. We're going to read several verses here. Ezekiel 36 and 21. If you've got it, say amen. amen. But I had regard, concern, I'm reading out of the Amplified Classic Version. But I had regard, concern, and compassion for my holy name, saith the Lord, which the house of Israel hath profaned among the nations to which they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations to which you went. Verse 23, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name and separate it for its holy purpose from all that defiles it. My name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know. They will understand. And they will realize that I am the Lord, the sovereign ruler, who calls forth loyalty and obedient service when I shall be set apart by you and my holiness vindicated in you before their eyes and yours. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries and bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a new heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall heed my ordinances and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And you shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness. And I will call forth the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and increase of the field, that you may no more suffer the reproach and disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you shall earnestly remember. Then you shall earnestly remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good. And you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominable deeds. My assignment to you today is to tell you about when the sovereign takes over. When the sovereign takes over. Turn your neighbor and say, He's taking over. He's taking over. Lord, we come before you today to hear a word from you. We give you thanks and glory and honor and praise because you're worthy of it. Your holy name requires it. We give you thanks, God. Lord, as I preach your word, let it fall on fresh, fertile soil, Jesus. Lord, let it take root and produce a fruitful vine, Jesus. Lord, let your word accomplish that which it seeks to do in this place. Let each and every ear that heareth your word today be blessed in the name of Jesus. We give you thanks and praise, and we say the name of Jesus together. In the name of Jesus, you may be seated. Amen. Now, sovereign, I looked up several different definitions of this. It can be used as an adjective 
to describe a state of power, supreme in power and rank. Or it can be used as a noun to define a title. One who possesses absolute, unlimited power. A supreme ruler having the highest power above all others. The dominant power and supreme authority. The sovereign doesn't ask permission. The sovereign doesn't make requests. All things are under him and serve his will and purpose. He takes orders from no one. He is second to no one. He defines his own class above all others. He shares power and authority with no one. Nothing happens in his kingdom without his authorization. You don't enter into his throne room without invitation. You don't approach the throne unless he extends to you his royal scepter. When you enter into his presence, you bow before him. It's protocol. That's what you do. When you see the Queen of England or now the King of England, there are protocols. You don't walk too close to them unless invited. You don't even get in the room unless invited. If she allows you to, you walk slowly. You bow. You address her as, or him as your majesty. And then you address them subsequently as ma'am or sir. There are protocols when you approach the sovereign. You acknowledge his dominion and his power and authority over you. With one word, he can have you removed from the kingdom. Or he can have you seated at the table. All things happen according to the order of his choosing. This is the sovereign. He reigns over everything. There is no back talking to the sovereign. There is no argument. There is no debate. There is no proving of him. There is no questioning his word when it goes forth. There is no taking his name or his title lightly. His name is greatest among all. He, this is the sovereign. He reigns and rules over everything. The sovereign doesn't give an uneducated opinion. The sovereign doesn't need your counsel. His word is absolute. His word are, is final. His decisions are final. When he decides something will be, that is what will happen. When he says you are healed, that is what will happen. Period. When his word goes forth, immediately things start to happen. Who am I talking about in this place? This is the sovereign God that I'm talking about. He is before all things. By him all things consist. All things come from God. He is not a thing. He is the manufacturer of all things. God is above all things. He exists. He just exists. He didn't come into being. He was there before anything else. He will always be the same. He is God and he never changes. He reigns high and supreme. Things change. People change. Circumstances change. Sicknesses change. Finances change. Landscapes change. But I am the Lord thy God and I change not. There's no debate. There's no thesis to be proven. I am God and beside me there is no other. I am God and I reign. I look for someone greater than myself and finding none, I swear by myself that my word is true. This is an absolute. His word says demons tremble. Witches run. Demon legions beg me to leave them alone. I reign in your world. I reign in their world. I kicked Lucifer out of heaven because I reign in, in heaven and on earth. I'm in charge and it is what I say it is. If I say live, they can't kill you. The gun can't kill you. The diabetes can't kill you. The kidney failure can't kill you. The cancer can't kill you. The lung disease can't kill you. The heart attack can't kill you. If I say live, that is what is. I reign over cancer. I reign over diabetes. I reign over gunshots and trauma. I am God and I reign supreme. God! Shout God! The very notion of him causes us to worship him and tremble. The sovereign God, he reigns absolutely. He reigns over witches. He reigns over warlocks. He reigns over hate. He reigns over malice. He reigns over racism. He reigns over sicknesses. He reigns over disease. He reigns over the microscopic world. 
By him all things consist, and he reigns over the, all the plants and animals of the earth. He is the sovereign God. He sits on the circle of the earth. The vast expanses of the heaven are a throne to him. The earth is a mere footstool. He is absolute. When he steps into the courtroom, it comes into order. When he sits down, everything comes into place. Having neither beginning nor end, he is the ancient of days. He's not limited to a building. God is not church. God is not doctrine. God is not religion. He is not a building. He is not a place. He is not a direction. Go to the north, south, east, west. He's God in all directions. He reigned before I got here. He'll be reigning after I'm dead. He reigned when I was in a, in a bassinet, and he'll be reigning when I'm in a casket. God reigns forever. If you don't love him, he reigns. If you don't serve him, he reigns. If you don't believe in him, he reigns. I don't care what you think or what you know. He reigns regardless. God reigns over everything. The sovereign God. The context of our text that we read in Ezekiel, whose name means God is strong, by the way, is that Ezekiel, as a young man, he was born into a priestly family. He grew up in, a, in the temple in Jerusalem. And he was born just before Babylonian captivity. When he was 20 years old, Israel was taken into captivity. And at age 30, he was called to the prophetic ministry. Young man, age 30. God showed him visions and spoke to him of things to come. He warned him to speak everything that he told him to speak. In fact, he made him tongue-tied. The Bible says he caused his tongue to stick to the roof of his mouth. And then he let it loose just to make him understand God's power in commanding his tongue. God's control over his tongue. The symbolic significance of God loosing it for his design and purpose. Because he reigns. We say all the time, you better watch what you say. Be careful what comes out your mouth. You better be careful what doesn't come out your mouth. Because if God says say it, you better be saying it. Or God may just shut you up altogether. So Ezekiel then begins to prophesy in the scripture. And he prophesies to his fellow Israeli exiles in Babylon. And God spoke to Ezekiel and told him to, told him to prophesy against Israel for their idolatry that was prevalent in Jerusalem. And it was detestable to God. And he prophesied of God's judgment and of, cert, of the certainty of Babylonian captivity. And much of this book is very disturbing. It's very alarming, the prophecies. And it's, quite frankly, fear-striking. But then, after the majority of that, occurs in the, in the book of Ezekiel, his prophecies shift in nature to one of hope and restoration of Israel, of reestablishment in their own land, and of judgment and defeat to the enemies of Israel. <clears throat> so I'm going to paraphrase, stay with me. In Ezekiel chapter 35, he prophesies according to the word of the Lord against a mountain, not a people, but a mountain. Ezekiel speaks to the mountain. God speaks to the mountain through Ezekiel's mouth. And that mountain was Mount Seir in Edom. Now, Edom were descendants of the Edomites were descendants of Esau. Edom is where the descendants of Esau dwelt. They were idol worshipers. They were worshipped, they, they worshipped a goddess statue called Quaus or Q-A-U-S. And the children of Israel battled the Edomites many times. And now Ezekiel prophesies to Mount Seir in Edom and prophesies against it. See, the Edomites gave help to Nebuchadnezzar when he captured Judah. And later on, after this prophecy went forth, they joined, pretended to join the Jews in rebellion against the Romans under Titus when he besieged Jerusalem. But once they pretended to join with the Jews, the Edomites, they got inside the walls of the city. Then they turned on them, they raped, they pillaged, they plundered, they killed, and they slaughtered the priests. And for all of that, as soon as they came outside, the Roman emperor killed them all. And that was the end of the Edomites. That's the end. There were never any more. 
But before all that, Ezekiel prophesied, saying, I will make you a desolation. I will lay waste to your cities. The prophecy to the mountain where the Edomites dwelt. You shall be desolate. Because of you, Esau, because of you, Esau, meaning the people of the Edomites, have had a perpetual enmity for Jacob and gave the sons of Israel to the sword during Babylonian rule as a punishment. I will slaughter you all. Since you could not live without bloodshed, bloodshed shall pursue you. Have we heard that before? You live by the sword, you're going to... I will fill you, mountain of Seir, with slain men and make you a perpetual desolation because you said Israel and Judah shall be mine, although the Lord was there the whole time. And you shall know that I am the Lord, the sovereign ruler, and that I have heard all your revelings and scornful speeches that you have uttered against the mountains of Israel. Mountains talking to mountains. Thus you have boasted and magnified yourself against me, the Lord, the sovereign, with your mouth, multiplying your words against me. And the scripture says, I have heard it. Oh, be careful what comes out of your mouth. You do not mess with or prophesy against the Lord's people or, as evident in this scripture, their stuff. You don't prophesy against their land, their promise, their inheritance. He said, I will deal with you. Because you said the mountains in the land of Israel are laid waste and desolate, they are given to us to devour, and you rejoiced over it. Because you said that against my people, where I was living the whole time. So that's what I will do to you. He hears all things. Be careful what comes out of your mouth. So Ezekiel prophesies to the mountains of the Edomites what will happen to the people who inhabit it. And God speaks through Ezekiel to the land of the enemy. You think he only speaks to humans? You've been waiting on a word for the Lord. He might be talking to the mountain that's in front of you. You think all things in the earth don't listen to him? All of creation listens to and obeys the sovereign. The earth obeys him. The galaxies obey him. The stars, the sun, the moon, the universe obeys his command. Nothing exists but by his good pleasure because he reigns supreme. All of his creations know their place and they fall in order when he steps on the scene. If something does not serve the purpose for which he created it, immediately the thing is cursed and becomes desolate. And other forms take that thing's place. Let me go deeper in this. Jesus was hungry. He goes up to a fig tree. He sees it. He goes up to it, sees it doesn't have any fruit. What does he do? He curses it, and it shrivels up and dies. It did not fulfill the purpose that it was created to do. So what happened? Death. Boom. There is an order, and there is a purpose to everything that he has created. But everything in the universe, in all his creation, has one unified purpose of giving honor to his name. I said everything in the universe has one unified purpose of giving honor and glory to his name. The angels cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The Bible says we were created to sing his praises and cry out glory and honor to his name. But if we don't fulfill our purpose, what does it say? We get replaced with rocks. (laughs) Rocks cry out praises to his name in our place. If those to whom he has given a voice do not use it to his purpose, we risk getting cursed and being replaced with an inanimate object. Because he is the sovereign. And he will be praised in the heavens and in the earth. Turn to your neighbor and said, he reigns supreme. So God speaks to all things in the earth. We know this. It's how he created the earth. Let the earth bring forth fruit and vegetation. Let the oceans bring forth the fish. You know the story. So he speaks and things happen because he is the sovereign. What he says goes. There's no argument back from creation. If it doesn't fulfill its purpose, it's cursed and it's ruined. He cursed Lucifer and made him fall from heaven because he didn't fulfill his purpose. So the prophetic word of the Lord to you today is... God has spoken to the enemy's camp. He has spoken to the mountains of the enemy. He has spoken to the demon habitation and all of hell. 
He has spoken to them and said these words. I have heard all of your torment and scornful speeches that you have uttered against my people. And because you have boasted and magnified yourself against me with your mouth, multiplying your words against me, because you said the people of God and their things are given to us to devour, and you rejoiced over it, so that's what I will do to you. And you shall know that I am the Lord, the sovereign ruler. Turn to your neighbor and said, he reigns supreme. So Ezekiel 35, Ezekiel is prophesying against the mountains of the enemies of the children of Israel. And then in chapter 36 brings us to our text, and he opens the chapter by prophesying to the mountains then of Israel. The mountains, not the people of Israel, not his children, the mountains. But his tone is very different to the mountains of Israel than those of Seir, the Edomites. It's very different prophecy, very different words. And I don't have time to read through the whole chapter. It's all tremendous. But he says, Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains and the hills, to the ravines and the valleys, to the desolate wastes and the cities that are forsaken, that have become prey and a derision to the rest of the nations that are round about. Surely in the fire, my hot jealousy, have I spoken against the rest of the nations and against all of Edom, who have given themselves my land. My land, the Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the earth. It belongs to him. Everything in it belongs to him. It was created by him and all things consist because of him. You belong to him. Turn to your neighbor and say, you belong to him. He says, surely the fire of my hot jealousy have I spoken. You have given yourselves my land with wholehearted joy and with the uttermost contempt. And behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and in my wrath because you have suffered the shame and reproach of the nations. But you, O mountains of Israel, shall, listen to this, shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are soon to come home. My people are soon to come home. You shall shoot forth your branches and be fruitful and lush and plenteous for them. You, the earth, will obey my command and make ready to prosper my people because they are soon to come home. Come on, somebody. They are soon to come home. The people of God are soon to step into something bigger here. For behold, I am for you and I will turn to you, mountains of Israel, and you shall be tilled and sown and I will multiply men upon you. The whole house of Israel, even all of it, the cities shall be inhabited and the waste places shall be rebuilt. And I will do better for you than it was at your beginnings. Yes, O mountains of Israel, I will cause men to walk upon you, even my people Israel, and they shall possess you and you shall be their inheritance. The word of the Lord to someone in here today is, he's speaking to the things in your future right now, making them ready for you. You're not there yet, you haven't stepped in yet, but he's been preparing. See, here the mountains of Israel have been made desolate by the enemy, and he says, mountains, your latter days will be better than your former days. You will spring up plants and vegetation. The cattle will multiply upon you. Men will walk upon you. You'll be a lush place, a promised land for my children. He speaks to them because of the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Listen to this. He told Jacob at Bethel where he dreamed the ladder descending from heaven. God told Jacob in that dream, I will give to you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Historians say that the land on which he was lying when he had that dream, called Bethel, is in the mountains near the modern day of the West Bank, which contains the cities of Bethlehem, Jericho, Hebron, the Jordan Valley, among numerous others. The area is considered the most fertile part of of the Middle East. The north of the West Bank, Ramallah, I can't even say some of these words, Nablus, Jenin, the quite varied in types of crops produced, but they have good and fertile soil, suitable climate year round. Year round. It's plenteous because of what God spoke to it. God speaks to the mountains and to the land, to the trees and to the plants. 
for his children. He commands them to bring forth, to fulfill their purpose for his people, to fulfill his promise to their ancestor. Before the people are ever there, he speaks to the land. Before you ever get ready to walk into your promise, the Lord has already been speaking to preparing the way for you. Someone, you're, you're not hearing me. Someone is going to get this. For he first prophesied against the enemy. Then he prophesied to the land of his people, commanding it to make ready to work for his people. I said the place you're about to go is getting ready to work for you. You've been toiling by yourself thinking that you're all alone working so hard. And the place you're getting ready to step into is about to start working for you. While you're stuck in your trial and all you see is desolation, God has spoken to the enemy and cursed them for the torment that they've been lording over you. He's already speaking to their, your promise in the future. God's speaking to the earth and commanding it to get ready to bless you. Someone's getting ready to step into their promise. God's already spoken to the mountain and to the plain, the valley, the desolation. He's spoken to the derision. He's spoken to the barren. He's spoken to the tragedy. He's spoken to those who are feel, feel forsaken. Whatever's in front of you, he's already spoken to it. And he's making it a fruitful place that you couldn't even dream of. Intentional, a beautiful habitation for you. God is speaking to the thing to make it bless his people. God still speaks to things that are not as though they are. He still speaks to the impossible. He still speaks to the unthinkable. He still creates when he speaks. He still speaks and things become because he's the sovereign and he reigns. Woo! You're praying to God about what you're dealing with right now in the middle of your struggle. And he's already answering in the future. Let me say it this way. God lives in eternity. Okay? We live in time. We're encapsulated in time. And that's all we understand. We don't understand eternity. But God, standing up on the vast horizons of the ends of the universe, above the universe, sees all things, including the start and the finish of time. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning... God spoke. In the beginning, he created. That's not his beginning. That's our beginning. He was before the beginning. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the only one that you can pray to in your present about what hurts you in your past. And then has the ability to go back into the past because he sees it and heal it, whatever hurts you, and then turn it into something beautiful in your future. What am I trying to say? The battle you've been going through is fixed. The fight is already fixed. The battle is won. You have an expected end. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew you. I ordained you and I sanctified you before you were even conceived. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you think because you can't see or hear him or can't hear his answer right now, you think he's just not listening. Even if you believe in him, you think, well, God just doesn't. I, Lord, I'm just toiling. I'm struggling. I'm struggling. The first time you uttered a prayer, he heard it, and he started working on it in your future. Yeah, that's right. yeah. He's been speaking to someone's job in the future. Someone's promotion he's been speaking to. He's been speaking to your spouse in the future. You know who you are. He's speaking to someone's new office in the future. He's speaking to your new house in the future. I feel under the unction of the Holy Ghost, there's a young lady in here right now who he's speaking to your womb right now to make it a place that is fertile and fruitful and a good and healthy habitation to get ready for something new to come forth in the name of Jesus. He's getting ready to do a new thing in you. Lift your hands right now and give him thanks for the new thing he's about to do. He's getting ready to do a new thing. He sees the future. He doesn't live in time. He just visits here and vacations in time. He takes vacations to robe himself in flesh in time. And then when that time span is over for that short trip, he goes back to eternity. Oh, hallelujah. What a beautiful thing he's done.
So God speaks to the mountains for the people of Israel because he reigns over the mountains. But the scripture talks about how the people profaned and desecrated his name. Let me reread this scripture. Verse 23. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name and separate it for its holy purpose from all that defiles it. My name which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know and understand and realize that I am the Lord, the sovereign ruler who calls forth loyalty and obedient service. When I shall be set apart by you and my holiness vindicated in you before their eyes and yours. What is he vindicating here? His holiness. He didn't say he's vindicating his people that have been tormented. That's not what he said. We read the scripture. He's vindicating his holiness, the holiness of his great name. Not for your sake do I do this, in verse 32 says the Lord. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own wicked ways, O house of Israel. The holiness of his name is that important to him. That he would take the people who profaned it, the very ones who desecrated it, and bring them into their own land and make them a nation anyway. Because of what? His holy name. His name and the magnitude and power that it carries. The authority and supremacy that is understood by all creation when his name is spoken. That means so much to him that he would bless the people who defiled it. The Bible says a good name is more to be valued than riches. That's, right. That's for us. That's how much he values his name. If he says a word, it's attached to his name. He can't go back on it. It doesn't matter what you do. I'm sorry to tell you, you're not that powerful and you're not that important. If he says a word, you can take it to the bank. It's going to happen. If he says you are healed, you're healed. You can try to stay stuck in your sickness if you want to. In your mind, you can stay going to the doctors and saying, I just don't feel quite right. But if he said it, that means it's done. If he says, I'm going to bring you to a new place, then that's what's going to happen. If he says, I'm going to make the earth work for you, then that's what's going to happen. Why? Because his word is attached to his name and his name is holy. His supremacy cannot be argued and his reputation of his name cannot be violated. He will be known as sovereign among the nations. He speaks to the mountain of Israel and says, then, verse 25, listen to this, then will I, not then if you ask me, not then if you come to me, not then if you seek me. He says, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from your uncleanliness. And from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart will I give you. A new heart will I give you. There's nothing in here about repentance. I know I'm messing up with someone's theology, but stay with me in here today. Then a new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a new heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and you will cause you to walk in my statutes. The new heart that he puts in will then cause you to walk in his statutes. And you shall heed my ordinances and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I have spoken to the mountain to prepare for you. You shall be my people and I will be your God. I said it, therefore it's going to happen. There's nothing you can do to change it. I will also save you for, from your uncleanliness and I will call forth the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine on you. What am I saying? Even if he has to bring the dead back to life and do a phenomenal supernatural heart transplant to someone who's not even seeking him, he has the authority to do that because he is God and he reigns supreme. Lift your hands to the supreme God right now. He reigns sovereign. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory, but there's someone in there who has been deliberately running from God. You have resisted. You have not allowed him to touch you. You have developed a stony heart that makes you essentially dead in the spirit. You're not even living. You don't even have blood pumping through you. He's going to give someone a heart transplant today. Ha, ha, ha. Woo! 
sometimes even if you profaned his holy name, he saves you because of his holy name and what it means. Sometimes the blessings just come because of his name's sake. His name is holy. Someone shout the name of Jesus. Jesus. Come on, come on, come on. His name is holy. Holy, holy, holy. Lord, we worship you. Your name is holy in this place. Lord, you reign over the heavens. You reign over the earth. You reign over every demon in hell. You reign over all sickness. You reign over all disease. There's nothing that exists but because of your will. You reign supreme. He commands all the universe. His name demands obedience. There's no place that you can go that you can hide from him. If you're dead in your sins and trespasses, when you've gone so far from God, and you've got a heart that's just stone, not even living, no concept of God, no concept of holiness, when you're so out of touch from the things of God, sometimes he just performs a transplant surgery right there, and you don't even have the ability to understand what just happened. He says, I alone am God. I alone reign supreme. Beside me there is no other. I have no competition. I have no competitors. I'm in a class all by myself. There has never been another God before me. There will never be another God after me. I reign over everything. Oh, Jesus. Lord, we worship you in this place. If you actually knew that you walked into the supreme God of all the universe and creation, what would you be doing right now? If you walked into the throne room and you actually understood who it was sitting on the throne, what would you do? Well, let me back up and ask you this. If you walked in to the King of England's throne room right now, how would you be acting? Respectful. Awe. How much more when you approach the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that do you not approach with fear and trembling? Mm. You think because you have a mind and an opinion and a choice... Because he gave you the power of choice. You think you're still in control of everything. Oh, oh! let me remind you, he's God and he reigns supreme. There's about to be a royal takeover in someone's life in this place. He still reigns over everything. You may make a choice because he gave you the power of choice that's not in the direction he wants you to go. But I'm here to tell you today that he can speak to the mountains around you and trap you in so tight that there's nowhere else to turn but to him. Someone clap your hands to the God who reigns supreme. This is what he says when the sovereign takes over. Enough. I will do this because of my promise to your ancestors. I'm talking to a mama who's been praying for their child for a long time. The word of the Lord to you is the sovereign's about to take over. To the lonely who have felt trapped and isolated and desolate and abandoned, the sovereign's about to take over. Come on, if it's you, you better start worshiping right now. You better give thanks because you know what the word of the Lord said. To those who feel trapped in the desolate wasteland of poverty, the sovereign is about to take over. Someone clap your hands. To those who have been tormented by mental illness and you've been in anguish and despair, the sovereign's about to take over in this place. To those who've been living in the desolation of depression, the sovereign's about to take over. We're about to have a royal takeover in this place today. To those who are having suicidal thoughts and you've been living with them, the sovereign's about to take over. There's someone in here who's been living with the diagnosis of cancer and you haven't told anyone. I'm here to tell you today, the sovereign's about to step on the scene and take over. You will get a report back in the name of Jesus that defies all knowledge of man. Come on, come on, come on. He's sovereign. He reigns supreme. He sits on the throne. What he says goes. There's no argument, no debate, no proof. There's nothing that he says that will not happen. He remains strong and reigns forever. His throne endures from generation to generation. Joel said it like this. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. They shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy. 
He says, when I dwell in Zion, then it becomes holy. When the Lord steps on the scene, because of his holiness, that which is around him is either cast out or transformed. He cannot exist but by his holiness in a vessel that is holy. He said, what? I sanctified you in the womb before you were even a thought. Someone needs to step into the prophecy. Someone's been sanctified by the blood of Jesus and you've been living in torment of sin. Start acting like you can access the blood. Start worshiping like you got access to the blood of Jesus. Start praising like you know the name that's above all names. So shall you know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy. When God dwells in a place, it then becomes holy. When he speaks, it's to make his presence known in all the earth. When you speak, it's to let people know where you are. You knock on a door, you say hello. You open the door, you say hello. You answer the phone, you say hello. It's to let someone else know your presence. You declare your presence when you enter into a territory. I said you declare your presence when you enter into a new territory. When there's a new habitation that you may not be able to see, you start declaring it in the Holy Ghost because it's your new territory. Lions roar to let other animals know, this is mine, don't come here. The Bible says, the Lord shall roar out of Zion. Come on, come on, come on. Somebody's going to get this in a second. The nations that are left round about you shall, you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and replanted that which was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it and I will do it. There is no argument, no debate. If I said it, that's it. I reign supreme over all the earth. When God speaks, consider it done. When he says it, it's going to be done, period. All the nations are going to see it. Now you think you've been working your holiness. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us, God, for our arrogance in your sight. Lord, you alone are holy. Our righteousness is as filthy rags in the presence of the Almighty, Jesus. Lord, make us holy. Jesus, inhabit this dwelling place right now. Inhabit each and every person's mind, each and every person's heart under the sound of my voice. Lord, make us holy. Dwell within us, Jesus. Let us feel the supernatural power of the Almighty God right now in this place. He said, your eyes have not seen and your ears have not heard the things that God has in store for them who loves him. Oh, hallelujah. Someone needs to get what I'm saying here. You think you've been in control the whole time. You think you've been working it the whole time. You've been playing the part the whole time. But in your hearts, you've got some wickedness that needs to be rooted out. I'm here to tell you today, you might just get shocked and the Lord might slap you over and perform surgery on you without a second to do it. God speaks to the desolate places and makes them bring forth life. The desolate places of your life are about to bring forth a body. Yes. Now someone in the sound of my voice needs to start fulfilling their purpose. Lest you be surprised about what happens. Yes. Start fulfilling your purpose right now and cry yes. out and give thanks to the Lord for yes. His good and His mercy and forever. Yes. He is holy. He is holy. His name is holy. Someone needs to praise God for His mighty act. Someone needs to praise God for what He's done.
cry out to your God right now. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, nobody else says your way to win. Don't wait on any of that. It's a chance to thank him for what's going to happen. Cry out and give him thanks for what the Lord is to you today. I know the thoughts that I have for you. I know the plans that I have for you. I have already set them in motion. They are thoughts and plans for welfare and prosperity and for peace yes. and not for evil. Yes. They are thoughts to give you hope in the final outcome. The battle is already won. The outcome is fixed. Yeah. Jesus. God is taking over in someone's life right now. I will replace it with the garment of prayer. 